Wow, I am super excited. I'm really humbled to be with all of you. And I like Michelle's concept of checklists because I'm going to check off one box right now by thanking you for what you do every day. And I'm going to talk a lot about the changes that are going on in education. But the biggest change is there's never been a more crucial time in the history of humanity for the work that's going on in classrooms and universities around the world. It's needed now more than ever before, as we know about the dynamics of skills, it's creating a need for amazing educators, and all of you are leading the way. And I have deep respect for what AVID is doing to drive the connection to youth capacity to change and make a difference in the world. And Microsoft as an employer, my role helping and supporting educators and students, I never have been more lucky to be able to thank and recognize the work that you're doing. Now, in the context of the changes that we see in the world, we often think about this as in a lens of technology. And many of you probably see slides and themes with, oh my god, there's so much digitization, there's so much data. The ways in which technology is changing the world is real, in some cases, scary. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Because as Michelle le led, it's really about mindset. I've been at Microsoft for many, many years. I've been doing this work probably longer than any, really, others in technology, because really, when the technology started going into classrooms, this is, became sort of what I've devoted my life to, helping to not only make learners' journey to the future possible, but really to think differently about how we really understand the dynamics of technology for change. And the one thing that I've learned is this is a people journey. It has absolutely nothing to do with technology, devices, et cetera. And the most important thing is mindset. Now, I'm lucky in my role uh, to be able to travel a lot. I'm actually leaving this afternoon to get on a plane to go to uh, Australia. And then from Australia, I go to Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong to Japan just next week. And I travel 40 countries at minimum every year. So I'm, I'm constantly seeing schools all over the world, in some of the most remote parts of the world, some of the poorest parts of the world, et cetera. And the one thing that I recognize is not only the importance of leadership, because I can tell you in all my journeys, and I've been to well over 1,000 schools uh, in over 60 countries, I've never met or never visited a great school without a great leader. In some, in some cases, that gives me challenge, because there are not enough great leaders. But we've got to find a way to scale and sustain innovation, share best practices, learn from one another. But the other thing that I will tell you, the most important thing for academic success, student achievement, is not the quality of the technology, even not the quality of the curriculum. It's the energy that students have, the purposefulness that they see their learning and their environment to connect to their future. And when you have students walk into classrooms expecting more from their future, the opportunity to achieve more is there. And mindset is so critical. Now, Michelle mentioned the, the dynamic and the theme and the recognition of limitless superheroes, which I love. I love the theme. And I, I, I see that all around. Teachers are heroes. Uh, it reminds me, and I was talking to Debbie earlier, who's from Brooklyn. My favorite place in Brooklyn is the superhero supply store. Many of you, anyone know about the superhero supply store? This is part of David Egger's work with 826 National. And eight, the Superhero Supply Store is essentially a storefront in Brooklyn where you can buy x-ray vision or invisibility cape, et cetera. And really, the front sells some goods, and it really generates some money for the nonprofit. But behind the walls of the school, it's sort of a hidden door. It's essentially a, a lab for students to learn, a maker space, a writing workshop for kids in the neighborhood to go. But just the simple connection between that sort of facade of what a superhero is, it changes the energy for students when they walk into the building. And I've met with students there. Just the connection to the storefront changes the dynamics of how students think of the time there. And there's simple things like that that we can do all around the world, and mindset is critical. One of the challenges is it's hard to photograph. It's hard to measure in the budget line item. It's hard to demonstrate to parents the importance of this. So it's often the thing we do last, or we put least effort to. But certainly, I, in the work that I've done, I know it's the most important. It's also important for us to restate the energy that we have around the evolution of the profession 
of education, the role of teachers. And one of the things that I do, I get a chance to go to a lot of these kind of conferences every year. And a lot of them are not directly focused on education. And one of the narratives or sort of the examples that I often hear to really criticize, frankly, the pace of change for education, and many of you may have heard this, that if you take a, an operating sort of room, maybe a, a surgeon from 100 years ago, and just transport them with a time warp into an operating room today, that they would have very difficult time with new concepts, new technologies, new approaches, new ways to uh, uh, perform operations, that they would be out of place. But if you took a teacher out of a classroom from 100 years ago, he or she would know exactly what's going on and sort of everything would be somewhat familiar. They'd get the books and it would sort of off and running. And that's often used to criticize not only the evolution of education, the role of teachers, the dynamics of schools. And in my opinion, and Michelle talked about this need for a growth mindset. I sort of looked at this issue, because I've heard this so many times, I said, this is not a growth mindset approach. This is you know, classic closed mindset, tired thinking, cliched thinking about the reality. And when I reflected on this, it obviously became clear. The role of a teacher is timeless. That's never gonna change. You can put a, a thousand years from now, this dynamic may look the same. But it misses the point. It doesn't matter what the schools look like in the classrooms. I don't care if the classrooms have newfangled wheels and we can move them around and circle tables, et cetera. It's about what's going on. It's about the connection with students and educators. It's about the way in which students are bringing their talents to make a difference in the world. And that's the part that matters. And when we reflect on this pace of transformation that's going on in every country, and I assure you, you can ask me a country, it's happening. The narratives, the buzzwords, everyone's saying the same thing in all the countries around the world. In Laos, in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in Zimbabwe, they're having the same narratives. I go to those conferences in those countries, we're saying the same thing. Everyone is racing for transformation to change the pace of education. And unfortunately, too often, it's about what we're buying, what we're deploying, what we're bringing into the school. And I will recognize that the reality of transformation, and this should hopefully help all of us feel better, not only because the pace of change is not certainly um, an issue, but the reality is the hard work is already done. The transformation journey that we're all on has already fundamentally happened. And there are three most important elements of the transformation that have already changed. The first is student mindset. We talked about the importance of mindset. All of you know, I don't have to tell you, that students in your classrooms and schools think differently about themselves, the world, each other, their own connection to making a difference, the energies they receive from helping others, it's different. And the global connections that we have have enabled that to be possible. We know that students today learn differently. They live in a world with countless content opportunities, ability to connect and collaborate and share ideas, with each other in and out of the school and classroom. They can share their voice much more actively. And this reality is true for all of us, but it's certainly true for students. And last but certainly not least, is the workplace is different. And it's fundamentally different in terms of not only the skills that are required, the way business is done, the global dynamics of market supply and chain, the way industrial in, uh, automation is creating potential risk, this is a real reality. But if you ask an educator, if you think about a school leader and say, students are different, they learn differently, and the workplace is different, a lot has changed. The role of our classrooms, educators, schools, is being to build off of this versus to build a transformation agenda. The transformation that we need is already there. We just gotta think about how do we enable that and extend that to what we do in our classrooms and our schools. And that hopefully will accelerate our thinking, but also bring optimism to the, the journey, because I don't think that we have a transformation issue. Sometimes the reality of what we think is transformation causes challenge. And I can tell you, unfortunately, horror stories of governments around the world with political agenda to spend money, to get votes, to buy devices that are literally thrown into a, a school in a classroom with no connection to 
mindset, no connection to curriculum and outcomes, no support for professional development for school leaders and teachers, parents who are uninformed on the use of technology to create a gap between themselves and their students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is these things are often a challenge. We've got to force ourselves to put the, the things that are not on a budget or a line item or a deployment task force into the conversations in our schools more actively. And I know many of you in AVID do this. We actually just completed a research study on the class of 2030, which, you know, essentially the generation of students that are in our schools today that will enter the workplace in 2030, and the dynamics of social and emotional uh, intelligence and what we require for students in their skills. So I, I can certainly get links to you to this report, but it, we learned a lot about this dynamic from hearing the voice of educators and students around the world. Now, one of the things about this work, and you can do akas.ms slash 2030 is the URL for it. One of the realities that we face, and Michelle alluded to it um, before, is this workplace dynamic. And I will tell you, we are in a, in a potential, now th there's a glass half full, glass half empty reality, but if we do not do the right things in our education system now, there is a crisis coming globally with regards to employment. Technology is rising and creating disruption in industry, and industrial automation is, is essentially eliminating about two-thirds or three-fourths of jobs in traditional factories or plants. As robotics come into factories, it doesn't eliminate humans, but it eliminates some humans. Now, this is true historically. This is not different. Throughout his human history, technology has entered into a discipline, a product supply chain, and disrupted work. The difference is when, you know, 50 years ago when you were building um, something that now is, you know, maybe 100 years ago you were building a horse and buggy and you were not nailing a ha carriage, you know, doing, um, you know, uh, work to build wheels for a carriage, and then we moved to cars, it was fairly transferable skill set. Now when we eliminate drivers and we are trying to get folks to program AI and, you know, build robots, there's a bigger gap. Now, we've got to invent new services, new capabilities, new deliveries, and that will happen. But we're facing a huge challenge. There's never been a, a bigger need for higher education capacity. From 1995 to 2015, the amount of people with a higher education degree, either in higher ed or get it with a higher education degree, doubled. There's an expectation in the next 20 years, there will be a need to triple that number based on the job capacity and gaps. Now, that's the scary, maybe, reality of what we're facing. But the other op opportunity is, this has changed the landscape globally with regards to opportunities economically. The way in which our e economic construct was happening in the United States and everywhere around the world is was jobs moved uh, the way in which we thought about the world, whether it's, you know, we had factories uh, next, next to natural resources, countries that did best, uh, work with GDP with great ports so they can ship goods back and forth. And people went to find those jobs. They moved to countries, they moved to cities to find work. Today, work finds people. You got smart kids with capacity aligned to workplace needs. Industry, entrepreneurship will form. So it's normalized the op the, and leveled the playing field for every country to change their economic future and con connection. Now, obviously, in the United States, this is a scary reality because we have the leadership with regards to the GDP and economic dynamic today, but every country that sees that today is, has the highest impact with regards to youth unemployment and job displacement. And these other countries, specifically Africa, by 2050, by 2050 40% of the world's workforce will be in the continent of Africa. And these countries understand it. I had a meeting with the Minister of Education in Congo said, we discovered oil reserves in our country. We're putting all of that money into education reform. I had a meeting with the Minister of Education for Kenya. She had a picture of South Korea, Seoul, South Korea, downtown Seoul, South Korea, behind her desk. It was just sort of printed out of a photocopier. And I travel, obviously, a lot. I, I said, hey, have you been to Seoul recently? Have you met with anyone one from Korea? Korea has a very distinct approach to education. So I asked her why, why that picture was on her desk. And she said, no, I've never been to Korea. But she walked to the picture, and underneath the picture, she had the same street from today in Seoul, Korea, the same photograph from 1975. 
And she lifted the picture up and she said, this is what my country looks like today, but this is the country I'm building. And the reality is, that's absolutely possible. We've seen it happen. In 1965, when Singapore and Jamaica became independent nations, right around the same time, right around the same GDP, very similar climates, land size, etc. There were two different paths. Jamaica said, we're gonna focus on tourism. And many of you may have remembered the Come to Jamaica campaigns that were very common on airwaves and television, et cetera. And Singapore said, we're gonna focus on building an education technology foundation for our future. Now, if you actually went to Jamaica today, it would look very similar to what it looked like in 1965. But if you went to Singapore today, you'd see a completely different reality. And that's the foundation of change that's going to be enabled in every country. And the US has to lead the way for our own transformation as we go forward. Now, as we think about that transformation, there's gonna be lots of job changes. And this is really hard to predict. And by the way, one of the other things that I hate is I hate the this, this saying around, the jobs of the future haven't been invented yet, blah, 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 because I don't know what to do with that. I'm sure you're like, okay, what do I do now? I have, what do I do to help my students? The reality is there's gonna be lots of new jobs. Your kids are gonna invent new jobs that we don't know, that's true. The foundation for skills, leadership, collaboration, critical thinking, the human connection to culture, honesty, ethics. These are the things that we need to build in our students. And the big C for me is not only, not only courage and confidence that we need to get our learners, but appreciation for compassion. And this is a reality that what's gonna happen as we think about these new industries that are forming, but it's real. And we've gotta do a lot of work to bring that entrepreneurial mindset to students. Now, this is happening, and I'm gonna speak, now I'm gonna put my employer hat on for Microsoft. Because as an employer, we understand this as the foundation for change. This job gap, this displacement, it's not a surprise, Microsoft's strategy in education can be easily decided, looked at by acquisitions. The biggest acquisitions we've made recently uh, under our new CEO has been Minecraft and LinkedIn. And in many ways, that's our education strategy. That's it, Minecraft and LinkedIn. We're gonna enable <laughs> students at young ages to have connection, to see limitless possibilities, to use digital tools to create, to collaborate, to share their ideas, to make things. And then think about their learning all the way through purposefully to actually do stuff in the world and then use tools like LinkedIn to get connected to the skills that they need to drive the future. But as a technology company, we see these three big changes as what's going to shift not only this workplace disruption, but the opportunity to create new industry, create new human capacity. And I'll talk a little bit about mixed reality and quantum computing, but I'll spend a little bit more time on artificial intelligence. Now, mixed reality is certainly here in classrooms. Many of you are using expeditions, having headsets, things like HoloLens with, with augmented reality. People may be playing Pokemon Go. Augmented reality, virtual reality is here in our world, and it's just the beginning. This is going to rapidly evolve. We're gonna to get to a point in the next decade for sure, far within, where augmented technology will be commonplace without any device, without any headset, without any glasses. You'll see surface computing, whether it's projections, smart displays, IoT technology that will provide sensor insight in everything that we do. Help us be more secure, buildings run more efficiently, learning space is becoming more adaptable. This space in mixed reality is going to grow. Quantum computing, which many, many, many not know a lot about, is a foundation that's going, and there's really a secret arms race, so to speak, going on globally with companies, countries, and certainly bad actors around the world building quantum computing. Because with a quantum computer, you can break any security encryption that we have in place today. Get any ATM password, get any Amazon Prime account from anyone, because the power of quantum computing is infinitely bigger and faster than what we can do with current compute power. So lots of universities and countries are building investments to quantum computing. But a lot of cyber terrorists, a lot of bad people are also investigating quantum computing. But one of the things that's true with all of these three things is it's impossible to find graduates to do this. Let's imagine it for a while this is a doomsday scenario where a terror threat builds a quantum computer and they start disrupting security encryption transactions globally. Every company in the United States is gonna have a demand 
for quantum computing resources. Can you guess how hard it is to find quantum computing resources? It's impossible. Uh, the reality is it's hard to find any of these resources. In, in most universities in 2017, less than 10% of computer science graduates had a cloud specialist focus. And every technology company, you know this, runs on the cloud. We have a mismatch there. Then it gets worse as you think about artificial intelligence, robotics, mixed reality, quantum computing. So this is a, a huge reality. That's why the, the world and STEM and, and, and the dynamics of coding is just the beginning. You gotta give students the connection to these broader themes. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI more. And I think AI often is mis mislabeled as sort of this doomsday scenario with regards to the workplace. It's far more connected to robotics as it relates to human displacement. AI is gonna actually empower humans more. I actually like to think of it as augmented intelligence versus artificial intelligence. And one of the things that AI does is it bridges insight from technology to understand the way in which we communicate, the way in which we see the world, the way in which we think about language and translation to enable us to, to think and act globally. And so AI is actually doing amazing things to drive change. And there's lots of things that we can do to make learning more adaptive with AI. And it's going to be necessary to deliver on the dreams that all of us have to personalize data for students, to help drive effective outcomes, to help every student avoid dropping out. AI is gonna to come to the rescue. It starts with a data journey, and all of you are on a data journey to do these th four things, and this is sort of a universal thing in schools for sure. Recognize where you are here, but understand that they're a continuum. The first phase of the data journey is collection. All of us collect tons of data. Some of it is paper, some of it is digital. The biggest reality, though, is most of us collect data that is not actually collected anywhere. Think about you as a teacher, or your, if you have a, a, a child, the first day of, your, of class for your child when they meet the teacher for the first time, or if you meet your students for the first day of school, think about what you know about the students then to what you know about them on June 15th on the last day of school. And how much of what you know is transferred to any technology or paper-based form, et cetera? How much of it is just lost? Thinking about what we're collecting is critical. Collecting as much as we can, collecting the right stuff, critical. But because there's lots of it, and it's all different systems and silos and learning applications, et cetera, we want to aggregate it and display it. And many times, leaders get too infatuated with charts and graphs and bubbles and red, yellow, and green lights, et cetera. But it's an important step in the journey to display this data and make it more transparent to the organization. The reality is once you get a transparent data display, you quickly get frustrated to see past failure and you want to drive future success. This is what generates the predictive phase, where you want to actually look at historical insight to say what could happen, how do we drive the change that we need. But the reality is you're going to need to use AI and machine learning to drive the real outcomes. And I'll give you an example. And this is really an example that's happening, but it's a metaphor in some way. So, so look at this in two ways. This is an actual project that's going on with the Snow Leopard Trust Foundation, which is a group of scientists that is researching snow leopards in Central Asia. Now, snow leopards is about 5,000 or less on the planet, so this is an endangered species. It's a very tough endangered species to track and locate because these animals are not only predators, but they also understand how to use their natural landscape and mountainous environments to their advantage to avoid detection, et cetera. So um, scientists set up trap cameras that literally, just like a, like a speeding camera or a traffic light camera, when, when a snow leopard or an object is moving, it will take a lots of images and quickly flash them. And these researchers, every, uh, every sort of three months or so, they set these cameras up and they take hundreds of thousands of photos during the week or two that they do this. And literally there were individuals hand looking at pictures and categorizing the snow leopards. Now, sometimes you get a nice picture like this with a beautiful sort of selfie for a snow leopard, but sometimes it's dark, obviously, so you may get it. Now, what we're using is machine learning to understand the fur patterns, understand the gait of the animals, and there's 
very similar fur patterns, but they're all slightly different. So you can not only understand if it's a snow leopard, but you can understand if it's one snow leopard or two snow leopards, because may have seen a different snow leopard than the day before. Sometimes you get what looks like maybe a snow leopard to a computer. It has four legs, it's got some fur, but it's not a snow leopard. Now, back to the metaphor. As educators, you often may see data that looks, okay, I can get a sense, this is clear. A student is failing and in trouble. A student is passing and doing wonderful. Sometimes it's a little dark. I don't understand it exactly. Sometimes you get some surprise that you didn't expect. When data is in, into our schools, we see this. Sometimes it's not clear what we're looking at. Is there anything here I don't understand? Sometimes we may think, oh, well, yeah, nothing to be seen here. But if we look closer, we may find that there's a snow leopard outside of our view. Sometimes, maybe a snow leopard is racing away. And again, as we think about data, this is a reality for our kids. Sometimes a snow leopard is right in front of us, but we may miss it. Sometimes a snow leopard may be even staring at us, and we see, can't see it. Now, that's a reality of the way this goes. Now, this is hundreds of thousands of images of snow leopards. Now, machine learning, if you think about this reality, can do this instantly. It can make connections. Let's look at this reality from a student perspective. Now, this is an advanced, avid school, I imagine, I'm looking at, because we're thinking about socialization, resilience, optimism, sentiment, consistency, participation. Now, imagine we're thinking about data capture on this level, not what you got in a fourth grade math test, but thinking about optimism, behavior, and the way in which you think about resiliency as a student. Just imagine that, that's great. Then I've got two students, A and B, Go do something, educators. That's the reality, it's hard. What do I do? I'm not sure which one's at a greater risk. How do I enable? This is a reality. Data alone is not gonna get there. We're gonna need technology to do this. Cloud technology, big data, et cetera, because none of you have two students. You have tons of students across a school, across a system, even a classroom. So this connection of what to do, how to respond, is never going to be something that the word data drives. It's going to be a creating experiences and using machine learning and artificial intelligence to help connect learners to outcomes, help create educators to pass of intervention. And that's the kind of technology work that we have to do. We need students to help do it, but that's the work that's going on. And there's a range of new productivity that's happening that you'll start to see in classrooms. You're already seeing it. And this is going to be powered by the integration of data, the integration of advanced technologies, things to make our productivity applications more natural in classrooms. Certainly bringing intelligence to everything that we do. Our learning spaces, the facilities and tools that we use inside the school. And lastly, making things far more personal. Using insight of learners. What's their hope and dream? What specific needs do they have in the learning environment for achievement. And one of the best things about this new wave of, of personal, intelligent, and productive technologies that need to come into our classrooms is they're going to open up technology, learning, opportunities for every student. Microsoft's mission is not, a quit, you know, not random. It is to empower every student on the planet to achieve more. And every single word in that statement means something. And the first one is the most important in many ways, and that's every. And what we've got to do is use these technologies to drive assistive, inclusive, accessible technology for every student on the planet. And we can do that. And this is something that we've gotten super excited about at Microsoft. And I'm just gonna, I can't see the audience, but how many of you know about or are using OneNote and learning tools? So I see a few hands, thank you for those. Tell your friends if you are. But this is a technology in OneNote. OneNote's a free tool, it works on any platform, Chromebook, Mac, Windows, phone, et cetera, to do classroom notes, sharing notes, teachers can do grading, et cetera. We built a tool called Learning Tools to help kids with dyslexia learn to read. And essentially what you do is you can take any text. I can take a photograph on a phone of a piece of paper in a textbook, copy that image into OneNote, hit a button, and actually cl get clean text that I can even have read to me, read in different languages. I can click a button, identify from, again, remember, from a photograph, it could be something you type. 
Where are the nouns? Where are the adjectives? Where are the adverbs? This is all coming from a, a very simple tool to help kids at a young age learn to read or kids who are dealing with dyslexia, dysgraphia, learn to read more effectively. This is powered by AI. It's powered by object character recognition, language understanding, intelligence services built into our core products. But it can do amazing things. The fact that over the summer, that a child can go from basically nothing to having the world at their fingertips and being able to read and being willing to try, it's, it's more than a miracle. I think it's more than anybody can, can expect. Even in kindergarten, Anja was incredibly bright, but he couldn't read. The difficulty reading continued to second grade. Shortly after Anja was diagnosed with dyslexia, a friend of mine said she saw something online about a tool from Microsoft for kids with dyslexia. I made an appointment at our local Microsoft store. We went in, they downloaded learning tools, asked Anja to sit down and my son read. It was amazing. Anjay, in that moment, conquered the sphere and realized that he could access something that had been inaccessible to him. I saw my little boy read and knew that here was an answer, that here was something that could change his life. Microsoft Learning Tools has been a miracle in our lives. He could get everything in the same font. He was able to lengthen his spaces between words. And that was amazing and so simple. Anj has been happier, more confident. He was living his life where the written word was an enemy. And now it's a thing to be conquered. So this is a growth mindset of what we can do as a company to help learners, how we can use technology that we may fear, that we may think is going to hurt human capacity to shift, to enable human capacity, to inspire kids to overcome their fears, to use tools to make a difference to solve problems in the world. That's what all of you need to inspire. That's why we're so indebted to the work that you do every single day, because the world needs it now more than ever. Now, we've got lots of tools to help you drive outcomes. And there's lots of technology, gizmos, and gadgets, for sure. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is leaning in on how do we help enable educator uh, potential as the core foundation. And there's many, many resources that we have to support uh, educators and, and leaders. And I often love, one of the things I love is getting book recommendations. And here's a book. There's, a, there's a, a, actually a book that we have online that you can get access to on transforming. And this has nothing to do with technology. This is guidelines, helpful tips around accessibility and inclusivity that we've provided from leaders around the world. If you probably just search on Microsoft Education Transformation Book, you can get access to this. Uh, as Michelle was talking earlier, I do have another recommendation. If anyone's excited about Michelle's tr checklists, there's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto uh, by Atul Gawande. It's actually an amazing book around thinking about a checklist mindset, around how do you think about driving rigor in terms of what you want to do. If you don't get a chance to read that one, you can check out this educator book. Thank you so much for the work that you do every day. Enjoy uh, this opportunity to connect, to share, to inspire each other. Thank you for the work that you do every single day. Keep pushing forward to make change for your future and for the lives of your students. Thanks so much.